Take as an example any business or profession that you choose, and you will observe, by analysis, that it is limited only by lack of application of organized and cooperative effort. As an illustration, consider the legal profession. If a law firm consists of but one type of mind, it will be greatly handicapped, even though it may be made up of a dozen able men of this particular type. The complicated legal system calls for a greater variety of talent than any one man could possibly provide. It is evident, therefore, that mere organized effort is not sufficient to ensure outstanding success. The organization must consist of individuals, each of whom supplies some specialized talent which the other members of the organization do not possess. A well-organized law firm would include talent that was specialized in the preparation of cases. Men of vision and imagination who understood how to harmonize the law and the evidence of a case under a sound plan. Men who have such ability are not always possessed of the ability to try a case in court. Therefore, men who are proficient in court procedure must be available. Carrying the analysis a step further, it will be seen that there are many different classes of cases which call for men of various types of specialized ability in both the preparation and the trial of these cases. A lawyer who had prepared himself as a specialist in corporation law might be wholly unprepared to handle a case in criminal procedure. In forming a law partnership, the man who understood the principles of organized cooperative effort would surround himself with talent that was specialized in every branch of law and legal procedure in which he intended to practice. The man who had no conception of the potential power of these principles would probably select his associates by the usual hit-or-miss method, basing his selections more upon personality or acquaintanceship than consideration of the particular type of legal talent that each possessed. The subject of organized effort has been covered in the preceding lessons of this course, but it is again brought up in connection with this lesson for the purpose of indicating the necessity of forming alliances or organizations consisting of individuals who supply all of the necessary talent that may be needed for the attainment of the object in mind. In nearly all commercial undertakings, there is a need for at least three classes of talent, namely buyers, salesmen, and those who are familiar with finance. It will be readily seen that when these three classes of men organize and coordinate their efforts, they avail themselves, through this form of cooperation, of power which no single individual of the group possesses. Many a business fails because all of the men back of it are salesmen or financial men or buyers. By nature, the most able salesmen are optimistic, enthusiastic, and emotional, while able financial men, as a rule, are unemotional, deliberate, and conservative. Both classes are essential to the success of a commercial enterprise, but either class will prove too much of a load for any business without the modifying influence of the other class. It is generally conceded that James J. Hill was the most efficient railroad builder that America ever produced, but it is equally well known that he was not a civil engineer, nor a bridge builder, nor a locomotive engineer, nor a mechanical engineer, nor a chemist, although these highly specialized classes of talent are essential in railroad building. Mr. Hill understood the principles of organized effort and cooperation. Therefore, he surrounded himself with men who possessed all this necessary ability which he lacked. The modern department store is a splendid example of organized cooperative effort. Each merchandising department is under the management of one who understands the purchasing and marketing of the goods carried in that department. Back of all these department managers is a general staff consisting of specialists in buying, selling, financing, and the management of units or groups of people. This form of organized effort places back of each department both buying and selling power such as that department could not afford if it were separated from the group and had to be operated under its own overhead in a separate location. The United States of America is one of the richest and most powerful nations of the world. Upon analysis, it will be seen that this enormous power has grown out of the cooperative efforts of the states of the Union. It was for the purpose of saving this power that the immortal Lincoln made up his mind to erase the Mason and Dixon line. The saving of the Union was a far greater concern to him than was the freedom of the slaves of the South. 
Had this not been so, the present status of the United States as a power among the nations of the world would be far different from what it is. It was this same principle of cooperative effort that Woodrow Wilson had in mind when he created his plan for a League of Nations. He foresaw the need of such a plan as a medium for preventing war between nations. Just as Lincoln foresaw it as a medium for harmonizing the efforts of the people of the United States, thereby preserving the Union. Thus it is seen that the principle of organized cooperative effort through the aid of which the individual may develop personal power is the self-same principle that must be employed in developing group power. Andrew Carnegie easily dominated the steel business during his active connection with that industry for the reason that he took advantage of the principle of organized cooperative effort by surrounding himself with highly specialized financial men, chemists, sales managers, buyers of raw materials, transportation experts, and others whose services were essential to that industry. He organized this group of cooperators into what he called a mastermind. Any great university affords an excellent example of the necessity of organized cooperative effort. The professorate is made up of men and women of highly specialized, though vastly different, ability. One department is presided over by experts in literature, another department by expert mathematicians, another department by experts in chemistry, another department by experts in economic philosophy, another department by experts in medicine, another by experts in law, etc. The university as a whole is the equivalent of a group of colleges, each of which is directed by experts in its own line, whose efficiency is greatly increased through allied or cooperative effort that is directed by a single head. Analyze power, no matter where or in what form it may be found, and you will find organization and cooperation as the chief factors back of it. You will find these two principles in evidence in the lowest form of vegetation, no less than in the highest form of animal, which is man. A good stock of self-confidence and a new suit of clothes will help you land a position without pull, but remember that nothing will go so far toward helping you hold it as will push enthusiasm and determination to do more than that for which you are paid. Off the coast of Norway is the most famous and irresistible maelstrom in the world. This great whirlpool of ceaseless motion has never been known to give up any victim who was caught in its circling embrace of foaming water. No less sure of destruction are those unfortunate souls who are caught in the great maelstrom of life toward which all who do not understand the principle of organized cooperative effort are traveling. We are living in a world in which the law of the survival of the fittest is everywhere in evidence. Those who are fit are those who have power, and power is organized effort. Unfortunate is the person who, either through ignorance or because of egotism, imagines that he can sail this sea of life in the frail bark of independence. Such a person will discover that there are maelstroms more dangerous than any mere whirlpool of unfriendly waters. All natural laws and all of nature's plans are based upon harmonious, cooperative effort, as all who have attained high places in the world have discovered. Wherever people are engaged in unfriendly combat, no matter what may be its nature or its cause, one may observe the nearness of one of these maelstroms that awaits the combatants. Success in life cannot be attained except through peaceful, harmonious, and cooperative effort. Nor can success be attained single-handed or independently, even though a man live as a hermit in the wilderness, far from all signs of civilization, he is nevertheless dependent upon forces outside of himself for an existence. The more he becomes a part of civilization, the more dependent upon cooperative effort he becomes. Whether a man earns his living by day's work or from the interest on the fortune he has amassed, he will earn it with less opposition through friendly cooperation with others. Moreover, the man whose philosophy is based upon cooperation instead of competition will not only acquire the necessities and the luxuries of life with less effort, but he will enjoy an extra reward in happiness such as others will never feel.